I call this meeting to order. This is a regular meeting of the Northfield Public School Board. Today is Monday, February 22nd, 2016, and the time is 7 p.m. Dr. Richardson, there are a number of items in the table file. Yes, <coughs> first of all, we have the PowerPoint for the robotics team. As you can see, they are ready to rock and roll here in just a few minutes, so we'll be hearing from them, but they also have a PowerPoint for us to look at. You have a copy of that in your materials. Uh, we also have the Community Services Budget Revisions for fiscal year 2015-16. And again, Erin is making sure that she gets all the appropriate adjustments before she leaves us for a while. So uh, that's coming up. We also have increase, decrease, and change in assignments. We have leave of absence, and we do have some resignations and retirements, including mine. So all of those items are on the agenda for this evening for the table file. Okay, thank you very much. If there's no objection, we'll add these items to the agenda as we move forward. <coughs> we now have an opportunity for public comment. This is a chance for anyone residing in the Northfield Public School District to address the board. Is there anyone here who wishes to address the board? Okay, so seeing no one come forward, we'll move on to approval of the minutes. Board members, you have in your packet minutes from both the public hearing and the regular school board meeting held on February 8, 2016. Is there a motion to approve these minutes? Moved by Jeff. Second? Second by Margaret. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor of approving the minutes of the for the public hearing as well as the regular school board meeting held on Monday, February 8, 2016, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Announcements and recognition. Dr. Okay, Richardson. I have several this evening. First of all, our Northfield High School Alpine skiers, Ashton Croy, Sky Sonega, and uh, Katie Rust, uh, qualified for and participated in the MSHSL State Alpine Ski Championships that were held at Giants Ridge in Bowabek on the February on February the 10th. So again, congratulations to them for state competition. And our girls hockey team, which completed competed in the girls state high school hockey tournament last week, played at both the Excel Energy Center and the Ritter Arena. They had a great opportunity experience for those student athletes. Additionally, Northfield High School has been praised by the MSHSL staff and the Excel Energy Center and Ritter Arena for the outstanding fan support and pep band. Northfield High School was the main contributor to a record number of uh, spectators ever to attend the girls hockey tournament during the quarterfinals. We're very proud of the team and school and thankful for such great community support. We'd also like to uh, congratulate high school English as a second language teacher, Jennifer Lompart. She's been nominated for the 2016 Minnesota Teacher of the Year Award. Lompart has been an ESL teacher for the last 13 years. Uh, recently, she added performing arts uh, teacher at NHS to her list of duties in terms of the Patino Play Festival. She currently uh, is part of a group of 114 teachers from across the state who are being reviewed for the semifinals. At that point, then, they will reduce it to somewhere between 30 and 40, and then a uh, final reduction for the final step will bring the number down to between 10 and 12 who will participate in interviews in mid-May. I uh, would also like to uh, congratulate uh, the high school staff and student body. Uh, we uh, actually are seeing a record high for the percentage of senior high students to graduate in four years. So our graduation rate now is at 96.53 for the high school, for all students. That compares to the Minnesota graduation rate of 81.9%. So significantly beyond that. And I think <coughs> the really positive messages are for our Latino students. We had a graduation rate of 93.55%. And for our limited English proficient students, we had a graduation rate of 9167 <coughs> And also for our free and reduced price lunch students, a graduation rate of 91.94. So again, um, excellent work that the high school staff have been doing and students have been doing in terms of supporting uh, students through to graduation and beyond. And um, the, the unusual thing I had, which we don't usually get, is 
actually got uh, an email from the commissioner congratulating mm -hmm. us individually for the work of our mm -hmm. high school and the school district. So a good place to be in terms of graduation rates. Mm -hmm. uh, board members, are there other? I do have one other. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> and it's just a reminder, and it's just a reminder again that the Area Learning Center's open house is this Wednesday from 3 to 5 o'clock at the ALC. Uh, again, this is the reception that is celebrating the recent award uh, in terms of the Outstanding uh, Alternative Learning Center program in the state and an open house to show what the ALC is all about and what they do. So I uh, would encourage board members, if you have an opportunity, to visit between 3 and 5 on Wednesday. Those are the announcements I had. All right. So Dr. Richardson, um, just announced that as part of the table file was his uh, letter of retirement effective June 30th. So um, I have some remarks. So I know that I speak on behalf of the boards and I, that when I say that it is with a heavy heart that we acknowledge Dr. Richardson's retirement effective June 30th. We have been fortunate to have him lead our district since 2004. While I know that in the coming months we'll have more opportunities to celebrate his accomplishments, I think it is important to highlight tonight some of his most significant contributions over the past 12 years. Shortly after his arrival in Northfield, he led the district through a long overdue strategic planning effort, culminating in our district mission statement, beliefs, and strategies, which continues to provide the essential framework for our decision-making process. In the face of an inherited 14% operating budget shortfall, his strength of leadership during this challenging time was instrumental in strategically managing the district's return to financial stability. Our district, under his leadership, continues to maintain good financial stewardship with exemplary approaches. Over the course of his tenure, the district has seen the successful passage of two operating and capital project levies. Our community support of these le levies is a testament to the trust they placed in Dr. Richardson's leadership of the district. Under his leadership, the district has embraced a model of comprehensive planning for continuous improvement of teaching and learning. Nowhere is this culture change more evident than the commitment of professional learning communities. In addition, Dr. Richardson has been instrumental in the success of several district initiatives, including an enhanced Copaneros program, response to intervention, positive behavior intervention systems, multi-tiered systems of support, transformational technology, thought exchange, as well as empowering teachers and administrators to use student data rigorously to determine the best teaching strategies to challenge all students. He has played an integral role in the expansion of TORCH and the implementation of the Ninth Grade Academy, Accelerate Northfield, the Northfield Promise Initiative, and the Greenville Park Community School, as well as the district's authorizer of Prairie Creek and Arcadia Charter Schools. And finally, his efforts in preparing the district to commit to a master facilities plan will serve us well into the future. Without a doubt, his greatest legacy is the work he has done on behalf of all Minnesota students. Over the years, he has worked tire tirelessly with both state and national lawmakers to help them more fully understand the complexity of education issues. His experience and insight has been invaluable in helping to draft legislation that has placed school districts statewide in the best possible position. It came as no surprise to those of us who've had the honor of working with Dr. Richardson when he was named Minnesota's Superintendent of the Year in 2012 and most recently the recipient of the 2015 Leadership Award from the Minnesota Association of School Administrators. We were thrilled to have his work acknowledged by his peers with these well-deserved honors. It is clear that Dr. Richardson has significantly impacted our district during his tenure in Northfield. <coughs> we are profoundly grateful for all that he has done, but most importantly, we are grateful for the opportunity we have had to work with such an amazing leader <coughs> who has always put the best interest of students first. His passion, dedication, and commitment to ensuring every student has, is successful has been the hallmark of his administration. We, however, need to fully acknowledge that the time has come for him to enjoy the next chapter of his life. It seems appropriate to use a car analogy when I say, <laughs> Chris, soon it will be time for you to drive away looking proudly in the rearview mirror to see a district that has been profoundly transformed by your leadership. 
Rest assured, you have set us on a course that will allow us to continue to be successful as we strive to deliver ed educational excellence that empowers all learners to participate in our changing world. Thank you so very much. Thank you. I'd like to, but I don't believe I can follow that. But I certainly agree with what you have said. And thank you, Dr. Richardson. You're welcome. I'll go on record, too, of echoing everything that Julie said. I've, I'm a new member to the school board, relatively, but I've been a parent in the district for a long time. And I also want to thank you, Chris, on behalf of all parents and community members for I was thinking of a vehicle too, <laughs> of not only keeping our school bus upright, <coughs> but it's always moving forward and it's always safe and well maintained and it just keeps gaining the best features every single day. So I think in analogies and I think you're leaving our school bus in extremely good shape and thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Other board members? Ellen. So um, in the summer of 2004, I went to a professional meeting for um, educators and I was cornered by some Osseo teachers when they found <laughs> out I was from Northfield. And they said, you stole our superintendent. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they said they just wanted to make sure that Northfield knew how lucky we were to have um, hired you. And so after seven years of the board, I can say that um, we are very lucky for your vision and your leadership and your stewardship. Uh, just well, thank you for all your time here, and I think obviously the, the thing that comes to mind is just uh, you know the, the, the place we were at when you came, and then now where we're at. So I think that that's a, just a testimony to, to your skill and being one of the one of the best um, superintendents in the state of Minnesota. Just glad to have you here. So um, I'm surprised, surprised that you waited so long, but uh, it just shows you your passion <laughs> passion for uh, for education. So. I uh, will continue to celebrate um, what you're doing and, and uh, you know, pass along that legacy to, to, to continue with the work that you've done. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Um, anyone else had any other announcements or recognitions that they wanted to? I just wanted to say one thing about the girls' hockey. I wanted to acknowledge the high school staff that had mm -hmm. to turn around mm -hmm. bus times and permission slips and all the different craziness that mm -hmm. that entailed to get all those kiddos over there. So thanks to the high school staff who made that work. And it's potential that we may have to do that again. So mm -hmm. it's good. <laughs> we have, we now have good right. practice. Yeah. Okay, good. So we will move on now um, to the presentation we love every year and still look forward to, and that's the high school robotics team. Um, we welcome Steve Taggart and his uh, team of students. And just a reminder, there was a uh, packet in your table file mm -hmm. for tonight's presentation. Well, thank you for having us again. Um, my name is Steve Taggart. I teach industrial tech at the middle school. And then uh, do this at night, I guess, mm -hmm. during the, the winter. Um, <coughs> but we are part of a group called FIRST. Um, it's a national organization <coughs> that every year puts out a, a game to, for us to build a robot to play. Um, FIRST was founded in the late 80s, um, trying to get people interested in science and technology related uh, fields. They have two core values that we, we try to strive by. First one's gracious professionalism. Um, it's a way of doing things that encourages high quality work, emphasizes the value of values of others, and respects individuals and the community. And the second is cooperation. And it's the idea that teams can compete and cooperate with each other at the same time. Um, so I think there's probably over 200 teams I heard this year. Uh, so in Minnesota. <coughs> so we have around 48 members this year, which is about double from last year. Um, and you know it's hard to get. 48 kids to work on one robot at once. So uh, we have various things going on at once, um, as you can see. Uh, so regardless if they're actually, you know, fabricating parts for a robot or building our website or 
uh, creating our business plan. Um, you know, we're trying to get all these kids busy and, and uh, helping us out. So this is our sixth season. Uh, this year we've raised over $14,000 from local businesses. Um, and over the six years, it's around 80000 that we've, we've raised. Every year it costs us $5,000 just to enter, um, to get our kit apart, I guess. And so it usually takes us another, you know, we, uh, we have a goal between 12 and 20 is where we want to go to, um, to b build the rest of it buy tools, transportation, t-shirts, food, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, but. so at the beginning of January, uh, we, had a, we had our kickoff event, and I'll show you our kickoff video in a couple minutes. Um, but we get six weeks to build, so tomorrow is actually the deadline for putting it in a bag. Uh, and we can't work on it until we get to competition in January, or in April, excuse me. So we go up April 7th, 8th, and 9th, and we compete at the North Star Regional at Mariucci Arena. So, can you get that? The first one, yeah. Hopefully it works. So, this is what we, sh we get shown. Welcome to the first robotics competition and the 2016 Tournament Challenge First Stronghold. The Alliance quest is to breach the opponent's defenses, known as the Outer Works, weaken their tower with boulders and capture. The low bar in position 1 is permanent. The defense in position 3 changes periodically by audience selection. Opponents are savvy and will be strategically selecting the remaining three defenses to strengthen their outer works while in line for their next match. There are more than 10,000 possible field configurations. Robots start in the neutral zone and may have one boulder each. Additional boulders will be placed on the midline and in each castle. Alliances may assign a spy bot to start in the opponent's courtyard and a human player to occupy the spy station to signal intelligence about activities on the far side of the field to their castle. The first 15 seconds of the match, the robots are autonomous and may earn points by reaching their opponent's outer works, crossing defenses, and scoring boulders in gold. During the following 2 minute and 15 second teleoperator period, human drivers remotely control their robot. They retrieve boulders, overcome opponent defenses, and score boulders in gold from their opponent's courtyard. The first time a robot fully crosses a defense, some of the base lights will turn on, indicating that defense's strength is reduced. On the second crossing, all lights turn on, indicating that defense is considered damaged. Once any four of the five opponent defenses are considered damaged, the outer works are breached and the alliance receives points. Human players deliver boulders to their secret passage through the castle walls. Alliances may have only one robot at a time in their own courtyard to defend their castle. As boulders are scored, the tower loses strength. Once enough boulders are scored in the opponent's tower, the opponent's flag will drop, indicating the tower has been weakened and can now be captured at the end of the match by surrounding it. During the last 20 seconds, robots may extend to reach the tower rung and scale the tower for additional points. If an alliance captures their opponent's tower at the end of the match, their flag is raised and the alliance earns more points. The alliance with the highest score at the end of the match earns the win. Step into your castle, proudly raise your team standard, and face the challenge ahead at this year's first robotics competition, First Stronghold. So that's what we see every year. They give us a short three-minute video uh, on what the game's supposed to be, and we have to figure out how we want to play the game and uh, what we think is going to be the best, our pe best possible uh, solution, I guess. Um, there was one other video. Um, every year, they, um, there's a chairman's award. It's their top honor 
Um, and we put together what, the submissions a video, and we put together what um, our team is, and what was our I forget what our theme was. Dave was working on it with us. Um, it was kind of focusing on uh, um, integrating the rookies, some of the rookies into the team as we even have rookies that are 10th, 11th, and 12th graders first year out, um, as well as the 4th and 9th graders, but just how do they get integrated into our team? So that mm -hmm. seemed to be our focus. Yeah. 2016 has been an impressive season for us so far. We have had a large influx of rookies who have brought with them their skill sets and ideas to contribute to the team. This flood of rookies isn't freshman exclusive either, as we have 19 upperclassmen rookies this year. Some of them have taken important roles on our team, such as Christian, an 11th grader who is a rookie, yet took on the role of lead animator. So uh, I am a lead animator here at the uh, Northfield Robotics slash only, uh, slash only animator. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know how to animate, I just call it. Jacob, a 12th grader who's a newcomer to the team, helps Christian by writing and providing narration for the safety animation video. It's tournament day and our heroes are up bright and early for adventure, but there are many dangers that lay in wait to stop our heroes, such as unobservant students, shrapnel, and other dangers. So, our heroes must equip themselves to be ready to fend off some of these dangers. Wham! How! Matt! With the dangerous defeated, the company escorts the robot to the tournament. Is that good team, Captain? Yeah. Alex is an 11th grade rookie who contributes to the team by helping with the building of various prototypes, such as this prototype lift mechanism. Alright, go for it. And it should uh, work better with metal. The design works. I'm assuming it's just a lot of fine tuning. Like we're, we're using wood here. We have better materials like chain, rocket, metal. A few ideas that we threw around. If we, once we transition this to metal for the actual robot, it should work. Harry is a four year robotics veteran. He has been the title team captain in various ways, including programming the robot. Recently, he's been working very diligently to utilize graphical image processing. So, what's in the grip with the computer vision engine to uh, users in different complex algorithms to uh, find things in the image from the camera? That's about it. Seeing our progress, it is apparent that these new members are hardworking, dedicated, creative, as well as fun to be with. When it comes to this season and the years following, the future of Team 3691 is looking bright. Ben, do you want to drive around for them? Do we have a ball? Up? So here's the boulder. I'm going to call it the chute. <laughs> and because of the, the color works, I guess, uh, we decided to use the track system up here. We thought the wheels would get us stuck.
issue we had shooting there was we uh, reconfigured to put on this robot. So um, the idea is that these front wheels spin, pick the ball up, and, and we can drive it around with the ball at a certain point. Um, and then when we're ready to shoot, we turn those wheels back on into our shooter. So anybody have any questions? Margaret, I have, I have two questions. Right. My first question is, can we see some video of you guys at the competition sure. when you when you come back. <coughs> and my second question is how do they determine the alliances? Um, they're randomly selected at the beginning. Mm. Um, we get like ten qualifying matches I think usually. Mm -hmm. And so there we get a schedule in the morning of the first competition and we are with who we're with. So okay. there's about sixty teams that are in our uh, competition. So okay. Again random So any board. group of four. Or more. Any group of three against yep. any group of three. Okay. So three on three. Okay. And then the, the top eight teams at the end of the qualifying matches mm -hmm. are they call the alliance captains. So they get to pick mm -hmm. the two other robots that are oh. with them. Okay, so, so there's an advantage to winning those yep. early. Okay. So two years ago we ended up being like the seventh number seventeen captain. Captain. So mm -hmm. we were playing that. So where our goal is to usually get in the top you know, twelve to twenty four to get you know, hopefully when we get picked or see one of the people selecting, so. Board members, other questions or comments? Steve, so are all of the components you have here, are these new components for this year or are you also recycling any components from previous years in, in this particular robot? Yeah, uh, a little bit of both. Um, a lot of it is new. Um, some of the motors and things we've recycled off the past. Um, there's, uh, uh, we have, we don't have six robots on there, but we had like four. So some of them work better than others, and so uh, we've kept together the ones that work really well. We have a frisbee shooting one that works really well. Mm -hmm. We've kept that one together, but the other ones we've taken the pieces ones off. So the electronics pieces are kind of. We like to try to keep the ones that work well together okay. for practice, I guess. And so we do, are there elements from those previous robots that have gone into the thinking for this? I heard using the, the tracks instead of wheels as a strategy for having more control over the, yeah. the robot. Are there other things that you've learned from previous robots that are ending up as part of the design work in this latest one? Yes. Um, this is, I think, the third time that we've to shoot some sort of ball. So we've always had some sort of form of this shooting device. There you go. Yeah. 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 All I need to do is get creamed in the top of the head and right off the head. Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yet young.
Okay. Yep, so it depends on what the schedule looks like. Sometimes we have half hours, sometimes we have a couple hours. Mm. And, uh, so yeah, we're but in the middle of a match. But no. yeah. sometimes you, I've seen if you if you get a chance to go to the competition, it's mm -hmm. it's super impressive. It's at Mariucci Arena, so yeah. you're at the the Gopher Hockey venue, mm -hmm. and there's this entire kind of I think of it as a city of all the different teams, mm -hmm. and there's a whole bunch of other things that go into this. So they're scouting and they're seeing which mm -hmm. robots might work well together. You will see teams. Last year I observed a team in this intermission where they basically rebuilt part of the robot right there. And I think this was really a good example because you also see at the beginning of competitions where someone's bot doesn't work as it's supposed to, and just like these guys in just a few minutes here fix that one portion, you see this incredible problem solving happening mm -hmm. with pretty a lot of pressure because mm -hmm. these folks take yeah. this very seriously. Mm -hmm. So it is it is really the height of STEM in our mm -hmm. school district and the mm -hmm. fact that it's real world, real time mm -hmm. problem solving and it always it always seems to work out. Just like a, a theater production, right? Yep. You got to bag it tomorrow night, but it's going to be ready. <laughs> <laughs> it all comes yeah, together at the end. <laughs> but if you can go, it is even for a little while. It is one of the most impressive things you'll see. It's very cool. I, I try to give you guys a little <laughs> yeah. time there to get the vlog. Need a catch. <laughs> Well, we have no doubts that by the time it gets bagged, by the time it gets bagged, it will be ready to go. We'll be ready to go. Getting ready, so we do some uh, do some things in the metal shop, learning tools, safety, that kind of thing. And we also had two fun nights where we had some engineering challenges. And so Dave's going to talk about what those were. Maybe it's coming after you. <laughs> I'm uh, Dave Berkey. Uh, I'm an engineer and been working with this program uh, with this the first robotics team for six years. And this is the sixth year that we've been doing it. So. Uh, I was pulled in uh, um, just because I had a, uh, an interest, um, had taken my kids to this competition before, and uh, really like what <coughs> it offers, and I've had an older son who's gone through it, and now I have a middle son who's going through it now, um, and it's just a really wonderful uh, program. Um, so as these queued up through here, this, this first set of uh, drawings or, or, or photos, Basically, the challenge was, and I know you like to see kids, so this is what they're doing. This is part of the, uh, the uh, uh, first uh, challenge that we did, that uh, I gave them 30, uh, 35 index cards, just the, the little paper stock and a, and a roll of cellophane tape. And they had to build the, the tallest tower to be able to support five pounds. That was one of the, one of the specifications. And then they, uh, a, a little side award could be that you build the, the one, um, that particular one, the most weight. How much could that hold? They had that tower <laughs> held 36 pounds and we, we ran out of weights. <laughs> so think of those little index cards being able to support 36 pounds. Um, and I don't know if you want to, oh, let's see, it ran through. It ran through one step. Okay. Um, and with that, we uh, had the, uh, I was moving really fast. <laughs> the tallest tower support was about two and a half feet, and there's some that you can see kind of crumple. Again, they don't, uh, you know, they're trying to make it tall. It's tall, but it's, it just does not support. It doesn't have the lateral stiffness. So they certainly learn um, quickly. They've got a time constraint. They certainly have resource constraints and um, are working to uh, try to solve, um, that, you know, supporting a five pound weight. So we had a, uh, um, one award, and there's an architectural award there. So this is this is something that architecturally that is that's that's aesthetically pleasing, and, and the architects would love that type of of, of power, but it, it really doesn't support much of anything. Oh, that's one of those things that architects and engineers are usually uh, kind of uh, uh, mm -hmm. butting heads between it looking beautiful and and uh, being uh, something that could support weight. Um, so these are kind of again the, the teams were between three and four people, and uh, 
Um, we also had a, a team that was of rookies um, that won um, uh, to, to, and that was all ninth graders, to have the best design to hold uh, the, the tallest tower and be able to hold the most weight. They, they, they didn't take the, they didn't, they didn't take the, uh, the overall, but they were up around 23 pounds that they could support. So, um, now if you want to load the other, the other one um, uh, for the challenge two, for challenge two, we gave them a box of spaghetti noodles and one roll of masking tape. Uh, they had to build a bridge to support maximum load over a 14-inch span, and uh, spaghetti noodles are 11 inches long. So they have to come up with a, uh, um, a solution, and these are some of the pictures of the, the, the teams here of the bridges that they ended up uh, making, and again, probably three, three to four uh, uh, members per team. And we had um, awards for um, the heaviest load, which was around 20 pounds, and then we had an, we had an uh, um, efficiency design where it's the amount of maximum weight your load can support divided by the weight of the bridge structure. So how many you know grams it can hold versus grams that it is. And uh, I didn't write down those numbers, but that was quite impressive. And there's the architectural uh, award um, <laughs> on that suspension bridge. Um, that one, which didn't hold much weight, uh, but it did, <laughs> it did look <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> um, so, the, uh, uh, we allowed, uh, allowed them a constraint time and be able to uh, um, have um, uh, the objective of, of weighing it, and, or, or of loading it down. Um, it might be a little challenging, I don't know if you wanted to open the third folder, um, <coughs> Let's see. So there's a third folder that is um, embedded in that sec second folder inside the second, inside the second one. one, and it should be video. And I, you know, we could just run some of these videos. It shows that we load it to failure, and you can see. <laughs> 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 and that was that was the one that ended up winning. As you see, how many textbooks, and we, we had to, you know, we, we thought we were just going to be weighing it down with some other things, and it's like it just kept on being able to go and go and go. Uh, if you want to try the next one, um, this one also seemed to hold quite a, quite a few. There was uh, probably three or four bridges that <laughs> supported quite a few uh, books and, and uh, some some heavy weights inside of that one. Uh, coffee can. And some flex, a lot of flexure on, on these. And you can see that they extended way beyond. Now you can get a look of underneath that, how much flexure you have on this bridge. That wouldn't be a very good serviceable bridge. You wouldn't want to drive a car over something flexing that much. But again, these are some of the things that the, uh, the kids have to go through with, you know, little preparation. They just, we just, I just dumped it on them and gave them the challenge. Um, and I don't know if you want to try one more, um, but uh, this helps us a lot with team building, uh, team leadership. Uh, there's, you know, unfamiliar with with teammates, as we had lots of rookies. So here's the uh, one that's really, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not much. You don't see any books on there. I don't know how many bolts were inside of that. <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, they, they wanted to tape it down to the to the surface, which again did not meet the specifications. It had to be self-supporting, you know. So again, it, you know, I set up these kind of rules that they have to follow, and you know, they were saying, "Well, we're going to tape it down." No, that does not that does not fly. You got to read the specifications, and you got to follow them. And that, that with engineering, that's what you have to do. Um, but the, helping engage all teammates, um, you know, and having. Uh, teammates working with each other that, you know, the, the ones that haven't been in our program, um, working with maybe some veterans or maybe it's just a group of rookies. Um, they have a time constraint, they have to make decisions, um, uh, lots of group dynamics. Uh, for designing and engineering, they got to seek ideas, uh, they're presenting concepts, uh, designing, they design decision making, they do rapid prototyping, see if something is, is going to work. Um, and then checking the spec compliance, which again, some were, 
we're trying to stretch stretch that uh, to their interpretation. And then it's an iterative process, design, concept, prototyping, testing, redesign, modification, prototyping, testing, redesign, and, and that's the iterative process. And that's what we go through with this. Um, and we start out with the building the large robot that we have multiple concepts that we have and we just get teams that, okay, you're going to build this arm and you're going to do this style. And they, they build it and then, and then whichever one seems to be the best uh, that would work for what we're trying to achieve is the one that we go with. Um, and uh, anyway, it's, it's just a, uh, um, the, the, the final is the intermediate um, testing using similar conditions. Some people were wanting the official five pound weight. No, you can't. But that didn't mean they couldn't go, oh, I'm going to get something that's about five pounds and I'm going to kind of test it here in advance. So again, it, it's some of the creative thinking that these kids are going through. And then the final testing for compliance, and then we did load tester testing to failure. And, and again, that's something that, again, it's, it, it, a lot of things came out with, with that and, and it, was, it was fun to go through those two different challenges. One was early in our preseason and one was later in our preseason. But it, it certainly helped our group um, grow together and work together and kind of figure out the, uh, the whole team dynamics. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so we wish you all the best, particularly to the freshmen who will be at the competition for the first time. I think there's about 18 students here tonight, so we thank you guys for being here. And um, it's just been a real thrill to watch the program grow and, and the successes you've had. So we'll look forward to hearing about your success come April. So thank you, and we will see you again next year. for our second item for discussion, which is the Prairie Creek Community School Contract Renewal Application. And here uh, this evening is Simon Tyler, Director of Prairie Creek. Welcome, Simon. Welcome oh. back. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me back. Seems like I was just here. You uh, were just here. I was just here, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, about a month ago. Um, so I'm Simon Tyler. I'm the Director of Prairie Creek Community School, and I've been Director of the school for the duration of the current contract, which um, ends uh, at the end of this school year. So I'm here to uh, talk a little bit about our contract renewal application uh, to UR authorizer and to take questions. And I have with me uh, this evening, Russ eaton Lee, who is the um, board chair of our school board, and um, <coughs> Eric McDonald and Ryan Kreminger, who were half of the evaluation team that we work with as part of our process. Um, so first of all, I'd like to just uh, give you a quick um, summary of how we went about designing the application process that you've uh, had time to, to look at and um, give Ryan and Eric a chance to say a few <coughs> words and then for you, the board, to uh, ask any questions you might have as you consider this application. Um, so I'd like to begin by acknowledging all the work that Dr. Richardson has uh, put into this process of our application and the support he's given us, and you, uh, the Northfield School Board, for the time you're taking to uh, review the application. Um, before we entered into the process, um, uh, last spring, um, our board chair, Raz Neeb, and, and I met with Dr. Richardson really to map out the schedule for our renewal application process, which is uh, quite an involved um, process. And he reviewed with us um, not just the process we went through uh, five years ago when we renewed our contract, but really taking into account a lot of the changes and directives that have come forth from um, MDE over the course of the current contract, which has really sort of changed the landscape a little bit in terms of accountability. And um, so, so our renewal process was really centered around uh, four critical questions. Um, is our education program a success? 
Is the organization effective and well run? Um, are we as a school meeting our legal obligations? And do we have strategies in place for sustaining success and continuing <coughs> to improve over the next uh, term of uh, our charter? So typically I come before uh, your board once a year for an annual report and we share, uh, we try and share with you some aspects of our progressive mission. This process was very much more about um, showing that we're an effective, well-run school by this criteria. And so our self-study, um, the evaluation process, the annual reports does have a lot of data and that's really to uh, hopefully answer a lot of the questions you have. Um, around those four key pieces. So we followed um, a renewal uh, timeline that started last summer with a self-study which was conducted with input from staff, board and parents and really brought together a lot of the uh, data reports, site reports that we've prepared for Dr. Richardson and his board on an annual basis over the past um, five years of the current contract and then organized that information for you around those um, key uh, questions. We then shared that with uh, Dr. Richardson and also gave it to our outside evaluation team to review before they came in. Um, we did follow the template of past contract renewal processes in that we did have an evaluation team of educational experts who we really wanted to take an in-depth um, on-site review of our program. Uh, the team consisted of four members and we wanted them to examine our school's progress over the last five years according to areas of leadership, governance, education program, special education services, and our financial <coughs> management. Uh, the four team members were Andy Harder, who's direct director of the Advisions Cooperative, uh, Ryan McDonald, a uh, Carlton professor and teacher in the Northfield School District, uh, Billy Ward, who's a special education director for Indigo Special Education Services, and Ryan Kraminga, who knows charters very well as former Arcadia director and now a curriculum lead in the Shakopee Public School District. Uh, besides the self-study, the evaluation team was given full access to all school policy uh, documents, reports, audits from the last five years. Uh, they reviewed these reports before coming in for their two-day visit and uh, had an opportunity really to do an in-depth study of our whole program. Uh, during the two days they were on site, the team met with and interviewed stakeholders from across our program, including administration, um, staff, teachers, board members, finance committee, and our special education team. Uh, really importantly, they, they just had extensive time to be in the building, uh, to visit classrooms, to see, see the children in an active learning environment, and really to gain a sen have enough time to gain a, a sense of the culture of the school and a SAGE's success. At the conclusion of the visit, they created a narrative report which they organized around those four critical questions and that was shared um, with our school board, uh, Ryan and Eric both came and talked to our board about their findings and it's included in your application packet. Uh, two of them, uh, Eric, Ryan, are here tonight and I, I would give them the microphone just for a few minutes if they're willing just to talk a little bit about and their experience coming into our school. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, I'll just kind of frame it within those four questions um, that we answered. That first one with educational programming and is it a success? Um, from the financial perspective, looking at in connection to the academic program, it's very much a successful school, both from their fund balance um, staying on top of their finances and then the ability to have a, a 1 to 20 student to teacher ratio within the general education classroom. Um, so absolutely with that, that first question. The second question, um, is the organization effective and well run? Absolutely. So in interviewing both Keith Johnson and the board and, and Simon looking at what processes do they have in place where they have that active communication back and forth? They have that ability to, to that check and balance to ask each other, why are we spending this? Why are we um, doing this? Is it effective towards our program? Is it also financially viable? Um, they have a number of processes in place so they are actively, uh, again, communicating monthly, yearly, both with the board, both the director and the CFO. Um, 
the you know looking at the other the legal obligations piece as an absolute, um, they have met all of their legal ob obligations when it came to reporting, and then also again financially being you know above you know in this last year 30 plus percent with fund balance. Um, and then the strategies in place for sustaining success. This is probably the piece that I asked the most questions and looked at was their active role in a five-year projection. So looking at where they're at, where they want to be, um, I would say they very much have a conservative approach to that planning, um, very much with the mindset of, of spending down some of that, that very strong fund balance. Uh, of 33 plus percent this last year. Um, the one thing that, that I gave them as feedback is although the, the amount of revenue is increasing, um, the expenditures um, are not, they're not spending down that fund balance. It's not growing as fast as it was um, previously, but they are still adding to the fund balance each year. And so if that trend continues, and they're really looking at how are they spending that money on students, uh, they may have to be a little bit more aggressive, uh, whether it's materials or uh, other programming aid uh, piece, but they're doing a really fantastic job out there. So. Hi there, I'm Eric Swan McDonald. Thanks for inviting us tonight. It was a pleasure to be part of the evaluation team uh, at Prairie Creek Community School. I've been familiar with it over the years uh, in my other education positions, taking students out there on a number of occasions, but this gave me an opportunity to really look at it <coughs> firsthand. And if you hear what the four, uh, the four team members, their roles were, I by far as a teacher had the most enjoyable one because I got to look at their educational programming, which means I started out looking at, we met with the administrators and talked about what was going on and we looked at test data and the test data were very positive, showing a very good, a very positive trajectory and some good interventions that have obviously, uh, have obviously been, uh, favorable, have been working well, but then I got to spend a lot of my time, a majority of my time in the classroom observing students in action. As you know, uh, teaching happens in the classroom, in those rooms, outside, wherever the students and the teacher are interacting, and at Prairie Creek it was amazing to watch. One thing that I always look for is student engagement and this, this beautiful case of what, I hate to word, use the word chaos, but that, that wonderful active learning process where, where it's sometimes it's even difficult to tell where the teacher is and where the students are. And it's, it's really great to see that, that mix in the classroom and that was very obvious and it was great to see clearly observe teachers who would uh, set up very integrated, hands-on, student-directed uh, student lesson plans and engaging students and when students would stray off they artfully were able to guide them back into the curriculum or wherever they were trying to go. Uh, great hands-on active projects. I had the opportunity to meet with parents, to meet individually with students outside of the, I'm sorry, to meet individually with teachers outside of the classroom, had the opportunity to meet with the intervention teacher that has been put in place since the last review to help uh, intervene in any students that are, that are struggling there at Prairie Creek or are showing signs of, a, of an achievement gap. Uh, we had the opportunity to meet with board members and talk about how they interact with the teachers and talk with teachers about how they interact with board members and obviously those conversations are very transparent and very, very positive. Not always easy conversations, but very, very important and well, heart, heartfelt and well thought out conversations. So I would say when looking back at the end, you could see my report uh, for the educational programming. Is the educational program a success? Is your organization effective and well run? Is the school meeting its legal obligations and are strategies in place for sustaining success and continuing to approve over the <coughs> next charter term? I have I give it an unqualified yes. Thank you. Um, so in conclusion, I've had to say it's very difficult to capture the story of five years uh, of any school in a in a 20-page document. But I do hope that the uh, data in there is helpful to you as you consider our application. Um, we're very cognizant as a, as a public school in the current area we're in of the uh, accountability we have to achievement even as a progressive school and really uh, try to uh, demonstrate in this application that we are a strong, effective school um, by, ev by any measurement. Um, I, I'm really pleased that over the course of a contract we've had this regular opportunity to give you a window into the mission of our, 
our program and we appreciate Dr. Richardson's annual visits to the school and the time he takes to visit with children and with parents and with teachers and all the other stakeholders. Um, Northfield Public School District has been an engaged and supportive partner for our school for several contractual periods going back to 2002 when we first became a public charter school. Uh, my my uh, feeling is there's a very strong now and very trusting relationship and a very open relationship between Prairie Creek and the authorizer and we work well together to serve local families. Um, I know that the support we've had uh, from you, the authorizer, um, is uh, greatly appreciated by our faculty, by our board and by our whole school community. Um, we feel this is an exciting time for collaboration. We're really enjoying uh, new partnerships that are emerging through um, initiatives like Northfield Promise and the related committees and work groups that are happening as part of that process for Northfield Youth. And uh, we want to continue to be a really strong and active part of that work. Um, on a personal note, just hearing um, Dr. Richardson's announcement earlier, I'd just like to say as director at Prairie Creek for the last five years in Arcadia for three years prior to that, uh, Dr. Richardson, you've been a tremendous support and, and mentor to me in my uh, leadership of those two schools. and just uh, uh, an open, helpful, and a trusted partner to our work. So I thank you and wish you all the best with uh, your retirement as well. So to conclude, um, our hope at Prairie Creek is that you will consider reauthorizing us and contracting with us for another five-year term. Um, thank you, and at this point, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. <coughs> Board members, do you have questions or comments? So um, I <coughs> want to thank you for the um, renewal <coughs> application information. It was very thorough. Um, the other nice piece is there were no surprises, particularly because you've been a strong communicator with the district. So um, there was nothing that came out here that we hadn't heard before, which okay. was which was good. Um, I guess my questions are, are more about the process. So sure. I don't know if, if that's. Simon talking yeah. a little bit about that, or you, Dr. Richard? I can sure kind of take us into the I next think, step. I think I so might be where you take over. I, I can, I can, and then I think if again, if they have additional questions sure. for you guys in terms of those. Maybe pieces. we could just ask. So, sure. so we kind of have two pieces mm -hmm. to the discussion tonight: uh, the piece around their renewal application, and then of course the next steps. So, before we move on to next steps, which I know will be a fairly detailed conversation or discussion, is there any board members who want to specifically address any aspect of the renewal application? Um, I just want to echo what Ellen said. Thank you. This is an amazing report. And Eric and Roz and Ryan, it was great to see you back. Um, <laughs> thanks for your work. It, it was uh, really well done, and, and it's, it's an, an amazing renewal application that um, I know you should feel proud of. And I'm glad that you acknowledged Dr. Richardson's retirement. And, and I know that as a board chair, I've always appreciated the wonderful working relationship that, that you guys have had and that we've always had with with Prairie Creek, and we know that will continue. So, okay. Okay. So on to the next. All right. So let, let's talk a little bit about the next steps. And um, I just want to I want to share some things in terms of my work with Prairie Creek over the last five years, and also um, as Simon has talked about a, a little bit about the the philosophical changes that have occurred at the state level as we move forward through this process. So again, thinking back to the fact that in 2010, uh, there, the decision was made based on legislative change to move into a model that was a much higher level of accountability and expectation, where as school districts uh, and other authorizers, we became folks who had to be more involved with measurement accountability and compliance. If you think about the first number of years as we were a sponsor, the focus was really on support. And I think that was great because it really gave us that opportunity to support uh, both Prairie Creek and Arcadia in every way we could. And I think, you know, the message always, and I hope you guys have felt that, is anytime you had a question, anytime you had an issue that you needed support or help on, you knew you could call on me, you could call on any of the folks in our staff and
hopefully we were able to um, help you with finance issues, with discipline issues, with uh, issues in terms of governance, with issues in terms of working through the process, even those really concerning calls when you call you called me to say my fire my fire suppression <coughs> system sprung a leak and I have X amount of water yes. in the hallways of my new addition. So yeah and, <laughs> and, and you know it, and talking about how those things go. So you know I think part of the, the, the really good part of our process has been that over the last five years, uh, you know, we've been able to continue that kind of positive relationship. As part of the, the next steps, really in terms of the next steps now, we have really two pieces to do. One is going to be uh, an evaluation by the district based on all the material that you provided us in self-study and then external visitation. We're going to need to provide a draft narrative back to you. Um, and board, you, you're seeing that as in terms of a draft copy. What we are hearing from the Department of Education is that although this was a perfectly appropriate evaluation document in the past, they're indicating to us that this does, is not nearly detailed enough for what they want. And in fact, the statement <coughs> is, um, uh, although there will be materials where we will simply be grabbing the same data from the state or from your materials as you've already put into your self-evaluation, or into your uh, external uh, visitation report, we're going to have to grab that same data and present it again to them in the evaluation document. And so a lot of the pieces around proficiency, around uh, looking at trend data for growth, all those kinds of pieces, we're going to have to duplicate those and put those into the evaluation document. We're also going to have to detail in this document at a much higher level all of the elements around the accountability issues. And again, it's answering those four core questions. It's, so it's really looking at student performance. It's looking at the financial <coughs> side, which again, you have been blessed with, you know, a great uh, CFO who's a, and, and a great uh, finance person that's been able to work with you through the years. Uh, so you're in, in a in very good financial position and I think we're gonna be able to lay those pieces out. Uh, and we're also going to have to take a look at not only your strategic plan now, but also your world's best workforce plan, which again was added in the middle of this five year period. And although it wasn't part of the original evaluation, it now needs to be included in that document. Uh, I'm estimating that as we put all this together over the next several weeks, that this draft document is gonna grow considerably in terms of what's there. Um, the other piece that is going to have to be occurring kind of simultaneously, and I'll be talking with Simon about that very quickly, will be we're going to have to take a look at the new contract document. Because we're, what we're also be, being told is although we've used that contract document for at least three cycles now, uh, that that contract is not going to be uh, what the department wants anymore. They want a, a document that is much more detailed is much more focused on accountability and compliance and measurement than it has ever been before. What we know right now is, is we had asked for some samples of that document. And I think if you guys remember your document, I think if I remember correctly, is about 10 pages long. <coughs> the documents that we got back as sample documents with uh, addendum and exhibits were 140 to 150 pages in length. And so we're going to have to work to put together that contract document. The good thing is I think we have some templates that will be workable. And it would be workable because they have already been tested by other uh, authorizers and have been found to be acceptable to the Department of Ed. But obviously it's going to change that complexion significantly. And we're going to have to take a hard look together at all the details in the contract because they're looking for a much higher level of specificity in terms of not just goals year by year, which we've always done, and which we, which we think is a really good way to go at it, is the idea that each year you identify the goals you're wanting to work with and we're measuring and looking at how those goals have been achieved. 
Now they're basically saying to us, no, we want five-year goals, and we want goals that are set in that format. And we're going to want to look at the trend data in terms of those five-year goals. The good thing is, a lot of the things that you are, have identified now, you've got trend growth data, so you can go back five years. You have trend proficiency data. We can take a look at those pieces. And I think early on, uh, in working with uh, Prairie Creek, we came to the, to the I thought of, let's take a look at a way that Prairie Creek can compare itself with some other charter schools that have similar demographics and also at least one of our elementary buildings in Northfield that has similar demographics. So I think we are at least a step ahead there in terms of that piece, but that is going to become a major driver in terms of, of being able to say, can we demonstrate that year in and year out, your performance has been equal or better than the performance of other entities that you're comparing with. Now, it's pretty easy to be equal or better than the state. Uh, it's, it's a little harder with some of the charters, and it's a little harder when you look at Sibley Elementary as a building to make a comparison with, but Sibley, again, is the right, kind of the right measure because it has a very similar demographic uh, feel, a, a similar uh, free and reduced lunch count, a similar level of minority student population. So um, what I'm saying to the board at this point is the work that's going to occur over the next month is really taking a contract that is was a few pages and I think very clearly laid out to create a, a huge contract that details at the level of specificity that the Minnesota Department of Education is requesting to share that data. And that on top of that, that the evaluation document, which now has to be included and given to the to the department before we can we can actually um, execute the contract, will become a much larger document with lots of other detail and lots of other pieces to it. Our hope and uh, and I want really want to thank Matt because Matt and I have been working on this as we've gone through the. The process, I think we're going to be able to get that done. But um, it is, I think it <coughs> needs to be very clear to the board that the level of work and the time involved here is going to be significantly larger than what we have uh, right now. At the same time, we're also working with the fact that the department, after going through and going through all the work that we did to uh, create our own renewal, because we're also this year up for a renewal of our authorizer uh, agreement with the state. The state is still saying they are not comfortable with a number of the elements in our authorizer proposal. And so we're, going, we're ask, being asked to, before the 29th of February, to complete a um, document that will share with the department how we're going to go about addressing those areas in our authorized renewal that they're not happy with and that they want us to do differently. That has to be done by the 29th. And then from the day that that's received and approved, we have one calendar year to uh, do all the things that that authorizer uh, renewal document says we have to do. So we can't begin to um, actually create a new, uh, what's called a AAA or a CAP, a commissioner's approved plan, until uh, those elements that they believe are not yet satisfactory are identified as being satisfactory. So that's running as a dual track. We again, we have till the 29th to get the first document done, then we have a full year once that document's approved. We don't know for sure that when we send the original piece in that it will be approved and we may have to go back and revise it before we can uh, get an approval of the plan, the plan to actually create the elements that they wish to have in there. The other thing we know right now is the number of authorizers in the state is shrinking. We just got word uh, just recently of additional authorizers that have chosen to drop out. At the same time, the Department of Education is advertising for new authorizers. 
Um, so I think I've shared with you before, I have some frustration with this. And uh, you know, I think we are going to do everything we can do because no matter what happens, you need to have a new contract in place by the 1st of July. And, and we need to do everything we can do to get that to happen. If we get to a point, at some point in the future where we believe we are not able to, to move forward, there are some trigger dates. One of those is the 15th of July, by which if as a district we choose no longer to be an authorizer, then we need to notify the Department of Education that we are going to no longer be an authorizer. And even if we use that trigger date, however, we cannot officially quit the authorizing process until one of two things happens. Either we can't get the corrective action plan completed and at the end of a year after the plan has been submitted but before the actual implementation of the plan occurs, if we can't get everything approved, then we cease to be an authorizer. Or if the choice is to no longer be an authorizer as a district, we still cannot finish up that process till the 30th of June of 2017. And remember that not only do we have Prairie Creek that's in this process, but guess who's <coughs> right down the, the pike as we go into next fall? Uh, we're going to have basically Arcadia who is going to need to go through the same full process that we have. Um, in my discussions with the department, um, I understand their desire for thoroughness. I understand their desire for accountability. I believe we have been a very accountable school district. I believe we've done all the right things for our two charter schools. Um, but what we are, are hearing pretty consistently from the department is, no, that's not enough. And a lot of what they're looking for is, is detail almost to the extreme in terms of every little measurement. And then once that measurement is done, then we're being told, well, at that point then maybe a five-year contract is not appropriate. Maybe it should be a four-year contract or a three-year contract. My belief as an administrator of 35 years as a school superintendent is I believe you should build all contracts for the maximum amount of time that we're eligible to do that. That gives people <coughs> security and confidence that they can move forward together. And so our hope and what we will push for will be a five-year contract. Again, uh, until we see how the department reacts not only to our uh, corrective action plan, but also to the draft of the, the evaluation and the draft of the contract we're going to share them with them, we don't know how much pushback there's going to be from the department on that. I guess I just want to be really honest with you. We're going to do everything we can to make this work. but. Um, I, I really feel like we are um, being pushed in a way that it makes this much more difficult. The other thing I need to make sure that the board is aware, uh, I've been meeting with the um, superintendent and uh, business person from Chisago Lakes, which is uh, the number two of only three school districts left in the state that are still authorizing charter schools. All of the other charter schools in the state who, or excuse me, all of the other authorizers in the state that used to be public schools have all dropped out. Minneapolis dropped out. St. Paul has dropped out. Faribault dropped out. Um, the only other one is Winona, and the only reason that they're kind of in a different position is they're a year behind us. So they don't come up for an authorizer renewal until 2016-17. Um, and so, you know, we are really uh, trying to see if we can work our way through this process. Um, we will know a lot more as we get closer to um, July 1st in terms of um, how much pushback and how many rewrites and how many modifications we have to make and uh, trying to get an understanding of what the department is really looking for. So, you know, I think it, as, as I look at the work that Prairie Creek has done, I'm very pleased with the work. 
what I really have appreciated is the ability of Simon and his staff to really think about as the department is expected more and more accountability that, that Simon and the staff have been able to come back and say, okay, we may need to change our accountability strategies. And where uh, five years <coughs> ago and before that, there was really a strong push to maintain work sampling as being the measurement. The, the, the focus now is really on looking at what are the appropriate pieces of the MCAs that can measure growth and can measure trend date over time and also the use of measures like Faunus and Pinnell to be able to get a handle on what kind of growth we're seeing in the reading programming uh, over the course of each year. So I, I think they have really stepped up and tried to, to put together assessment strategies that make sense. And again, I know that pushes against the core of their being as a charter. Because as a charter school, they're a progressive school, they have their project based in terms of the work that they do, in terms of the activities, what you heard Eric and, and uh, Ryan talk about in terms of the power of how engaged kids are and how focused they are, isn't always measurable with an MCA test. Mm -hmm. um, but again, what I think is important for people to understand is, is that's the driver. We're really seeing accountability is all around measures that, that they believe uh, you know, can be supported with the MCA and with other kinds of measures that they believe that we will have data that's independent of anything that the charter or the public school authorizer will do in terms of looking at how the performance is. So right now, Evan, they, now that was the dollar and a half answer to your five cent question, but really the focus is that the next piece we have is really the, the further modification of the draft evaluation, the, the development, and I, I've already got the draft of the, of the new contract document, but again, the contract document now instead of a 10-page document starts out as a 25-page document and then on top of that has another 125 pages of documentation that they're expecting to ins have us insert into that. And so we're going to, again, to do everything to build that. Understand when we did the uh, renewal process earlier this year, Matt, how many pages did we end up with? 200? Oh, way more. 400? 600? Oh, it's, yeah. I, I mean, I, I literally had two notebooks that thick full of the material that we sent off to the department and to the external evaluation folks. And uh, again, we believed we had shared with them the pieces. Um, I understand some of the elements that they want because they, they, they are really creating, um, you know, what they want is the ideal authorizer around someone that's not a public school. It's really around an authorizer that's a single purpose authorizer or a nonprofit authorizer <coughs> whose focus really is on doing this as their job. And understanding that as a public school, um, it's a great part of my job, but it's not the only part of my job. At the same time, I really believe that the skill set that we have as public school administrators provides maximum support, support that I don't believe any non-public, non-profit authorizer can provide. They don't have 75 years of combined experience in terms of working with charters. So um, again, we, we will be working at the same time. Help me, Matt, I need your word of the day. We're not bifurcating this time. We're actually on two tracks at the same time. Multi we're multitasking in, in terms of the fact that, that what we've got to do is we've got to do the um, renewal process. We need to do the corrective action piece. We need to begin that with the uh, corrective action plan, which is due at the end of this month. We then have a year to address that once they approve it. Uh, they may come back and say, no, you've got to add more, much, much more stuff there. At the same time, we're going to move forward with both the contract and with the evaluation document for Prairie Creek and we'll work closely with them to put the pieces together that we need to do. Um, 
I think you can sense I'm a little frustrated with this. Um, these folks have been great to work with. Um, basically, Patrick and before that, Ryan at Arcadia have been great people to work with and have done everything to do what they need to do. And um, so there is some frustration with the fact that um, what we've done is being, we're being told just isn't good enough. Uh, but we're going to do everything we can to um, make sure that they have a contract in place by July 1 and that we're ready to move forward. <coughs> but as a board, you need to do some serious thinking as we take a look at the amount of time and energy that's spent over the next several months moving through that process and at the same time creating the um, the, the structure that we need to address the uh, plan that we have to do in terms of corrective action and all of the things that are going to be required to make sure that we uh, follow everything there so that we uh, are identified as being a, a charter school authorizer that can be renewed. All that's going to be happening over the next several months and as a board you need to do, do I think some serious thinking and we will try to give you feedback on that process over the next couple months as to how much time this is literally taking uh, and what amount of time physically as a school district that is also trying to support three elementary buildings, a middle school, a high school, an ALC, and an early childhood program of, of that are all growing and, and doing good things, making sure that we can sustain all those programs going forward. So I would be open to any questions and I know that Roz and Simon would be open to any other questions that you have about any of the documentation that they provided to you tonight. Board members, other questions? No? You don't? Oh, okay. Helen. <coughs> I have a comment. Yeah. So I guess what I'm hearing is that this is a tremendous amount of work and I'm, I'm really frustrated because it seems like this in the seven years I've been on the board that the collaboration is kind of getting to a wonderful stage. Yes. And so I guess I'm frustrated with how much time this is taking and I clearly hear Dr. Richardson what you're saying about all the other commitments that the district has. And I'm also concerned about the charter school and what uncertainty this is putting them in, um, both Prairie Creek and then Arcadia. And so I don't know what, how we are even supposed to react to a situation like this. We have this huge workload on and, and, and this enormous uncertainty for them. Mm -hmm. Well, and I guess here's my hope, and, and my hope is that if, if we can get a document and a new contract that will satisfy the state, then we actually have a template for the next one. And so I, I think a lot of it is trying to determine, you know, wh what is the, the state's willingness to accept these pieces and, and again all I would share with you is that what we've seen of the school districts or not school districts of the authorizers that have been successful so far it seems like the focus is on mountains of data and mountains of detail and you know I guess my my belief is you know, I, I think I can go into Simon's building or into Patrick's building and in a day from 7.30 in the morning till 5 o'clock at night, I've got a real good feel about how the building is working and, mm -hmm. and what the pieces are and the quality of the staff and the quality of the folks that are working in that building and how kids are engaged. And I don't think that the level of detail here works and it may be, it just, it's what it has to do when you have a charter authorizer that has 30 or 40 charter schools and is trying to balance all those charters and make sure. What we're hearing already from some of the other charters that we know that have some of these authorizers as their authorizers are saying it's all about data. We're constantly having to feed data to the, to the authorizer so we, do we have enough information and it's a constant request for give me the data so we know you're compliant. Give us the data so we know you're, you've got what you have to get done. And the problem I see for, ch for charter schools is the same issue that it's, we're facing as a school district is 
for all the time you spend <coughs> doing that, you can't be doing what you want to do and not what you have as a heart and soul of your entity as a charter school get, is deflected by the, that, that constant voracious need for data. What we also know is, is that as we look at, at this process, and um, Matt, you're not close enough to kick me under the table yet, so <laughs> I, I'm going to frame this very carefully. My belief is that in 2010, when the <coughs> legislature said to, the, to MDE that we really need to modify this process and make this much more accountable because they were running into <coughs> charters that either uh, misused their funds mm -hmm. or spent all their money <coughs> in the first month or were doing things in terms of instruction that were totally inappropriate <coughs> and illegal, that the department's response was, we're going to ramp this up so much that we're <coughs> protecting ourselves as MDE. And I think in terms of, of working this forward, that's what it feels like right now, is that we have this tremendous need for, for MDE to be able to say, well, look, this authorizer has looked at all this detail and is able to feed all that detail to us every time we need it. Therefore, everything is going to be <coughs> The other thing that's really different is before 2010, when a charter was in trouble, and if you think back to the village school, when the village school was in trouble, and we went to the department and said, we're concerned that they cannot continue to function. We're really concerned about their uh, operation. We're really concerned about how, uh, how safe their building is for kids. The department came to <coughs> our side and said, we, we will help you with the attorneys and the other folks that need to be there. They went to us you know, after we closed the building and we ended up being sued and needed to go to district court the Attorney General's office was right with us from the department supporting the process. When we ended up going to the appellate court because they wanted to continue to push the process, the department came with us. I don't feel that same support now. What I feel now is they are really trying to um, protect themselves and do that by micromanaging the process that we're doing. And it's time for me to shut up now. So that, th that's kind of where I see the, the situation. And Evan, I, I agree with you. The problem I see going forward is if we can't get this into a package that we can work on appropriately mm -hmm. in terms of the time frame, I think it's hard for me to recommend to you that you continue to do this long term. And I think that would be sad. The, the thing I do hope, however, is if that's where we end up having to be, we will have created a contract document and whatever for these two charters that's going to look very much like the document and the data that needs to be in place if they're with a, with a different authorizer unit. And so it won't be this kind of, oh my goodness, how, how could this change so much? Have I said enough? I think I have. If I could just make one comment to close, um, just to uh, let you know, but we really appreciate, Dr. Richardson, your transparency around yes. what's difficult around this. You've had lots of conversations with me, with our board, and I think we totally understand what's going on here, the uh, challenges <coughs> to you as a district and an authorized in terms of the workload. And yes, there is some uncertainty for us around it as well, but. It's been an open, transparent process all the way through, and we feel well supported uh, that you are working uh, for a contract for us. Um, so uh, thank you for that. And I talked to a lot of other charter school directors around the state. I think there's what, maybe 160 uh, charter schools mm -hmm. in Minnesota right now. And they are always envious of the situation I have, we have, to have an authorizer who is a local school district who not only holds us accountable by the four key questions in that packet, but knows us, you know, knows who we are, and we have a relationship, they know what we're trying to do for kids, and, um, and it's a trusting relationship. I think it, it is a sad commentary 
on the way this has unfolded that that's at risk and that's not your fault and that's not our fault and it's maybe a bigger question about how we need to think about um, schools and trust but that's obviously a bigger question than we have here so I just want to thank you for all the work you're doing Matt for the work you've done for support for that I, I know it's a excessive amount and it's appreciated by our board and by our community and we'll see see what happens over the coming months so thank you thank you board members any other questions or comments Jeff I mean that process is just, it's just way too complicated you, know, you, you feel like you're you know one year you're kicking a 20 yard field goal and the next year you're kicking it and it's 60 so I, it's just I mean something's got to obviously change and and make it you know you know the department has got to it's, it's got to, there's got to be reform just to, to just to make it that complicated because most people the idea behind that is like we're covering ourselves but really most people are just going to get frustrated and quit and and how high are you putting that bar that you got to you jump over or that field goal that you got to kick so I mean I, I that whole the whole system in there somehow is has to be more friendly towards educational options and charter schools and things like that and, and uh, you know just needs to really be worked on because if, if I mean I hate to be arrogant about it but if, if Northfield and where we're at with all of the the resources that we have here and, and the, the mind trust and in doing that and, and all of the resources and things and thank you Chris and thank you Matt and all the put on that if it's that tough for us to do um, how tough is it for everybody else it just, it, so it, it's kind of it's really ridiculous I think that that th there needs to be reform in there and, and to push for that and, and uh, um, it, it's, it's frustrating, and I, at the same time, I want to commend you for all the work that you're doing, and, and, and you know we're getting it done. But it just seems you know way too complex. So yes. thank you. Other questions or comments, Margaret? I just had a comment. I, when Chris and I were speaking about this, I find it interesting that the data show plays out that the most successful charter schools have been advised by public schools, and that that model seems to be working. And rather than invent the wheel and invent a monster out of it, it seems to me that they should come and look at the relationship between the great work that Northfield administration has done in conjunction with these charter schools and say, well, whatever they're doing, that's the template. And make it easy because, again, like Jeff said, Northfield prides itself on educational choice, and every community should really have that for their children as well. So unnecessarily onerous, I guess, are the words I'm thinking of, and that's really a tragedy. Other comments or questions by board members? I just would yeah. share one other piece. Um, currently, I am working with another one other school district, Chisago Lakes, uh, and we have been talking with legislators from our own district and from Chisago Lakes about the possibility of doing some revisions to the charter authorizer bill and so we have basically a bill drafted um, and uh, we'll be looking at trying to, to get that into the legislature this year if that is passed it will uh, take away some of the pieces that we're currently being asked to do and basically replacing those with the fact that for those elements which are mainly the elements around do we do staff development that has anything to do with how you run a school and some of the other pieces that are there and basically replacing those with a an affidavit or a document of assurance which would help out I think significantly because it would reduce the number of areas where we're going to need to change uh, I have no idea how it will fly I also don't have any idea what will happen uh, when the legislators involved take us to the department to talk about this because at this point we're right in the middle of all this other stuff it may not be pretty but I honestly believe somebody needs to be saying something to the department about the, the structure that we currently have in place right now okay no are the new <coughs> requirements that you're speaking of we're trying to meet now a result of the legislation for 2010 the, the, the legislature basically wrote a much expanded charter school authorizer renewal process and a, and a, uh, 
and basically expectations for the contract. And so, and they did that, I know, out of wanting to avoid the embarrassing situations that occurred with several of the charters that closed up during the mid 2000s because they didn't know how to do their finances or they didn't know what their limits were in ter terms of what they should or shouldn't be teaching. Um, the thing that you always have to remember, however, is the legislature writes law. The department writes regulations and rules. And so the documentation and what Matt and I went through <coughs> earlier in terms of the renewal process, a document that's about the charter school authorizer law is about three pages long. The documentation that we had to create to address that three pages of documentation, again, was five or six hundred pages of documents that we had to send into the state for that renewal process. And at that point, only to be told in several cases, no, this is not anywhere near what we need. Any other questions or comments? Well, I appreciate um, you know just the the open discussion we've had tonight, and and thank you for acknowledging that you understand where we're at. Um, I also appreciate that you'll continue to keep us surprised in dates and and progress, and um, you know, I appreciate the number of updates we've received as we move forward in this process. So we'll continue to to look for those updates, and then um, really uh, be cognizant of dates as they as they approach and the decisions we may need to make as a board as we move forward. And I echo what Ellen said, not only, you know, we have to be concerned about the North Shield School District, but also particularly about the the uh, secure future for the charter schools because we have a great deal of respect for, mm -hmm. for the work you do. And, and uh, it at the end of the day, I think we've all said it's truly tragic that, that this is happening. So. We'll just remain cautiously optimistic as we move forward. So, thank you very Thanks much for yourself. everything. Yes. Yeah. Thank Good. you. Good. All right. So, we will now move on for our last item for discussion, which um, we have Joe Lear from the high school here talking about the <coughs> curricular additions to the high school. Well, good evening to you all, and I will not take a lot of your time, and I'd actually like to. Uh, to point out, I think this is maybe the first time in 10 years where I'm presenting to the board because I asked to. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's but all I, good, I, Joe. What's that? It's all good. That's exactly right. And that's the reason I'm here. It, it is all good. Um, what I would really like to, to kind of think about in terms of this, uh, this, this little update is, is really a placeholder in the, uh, the late winter, early spring for us to to seize an opportunity to communicate to you some of the changes, some of the, the additions that we're going to uh, be pursuing at the high school through the registration process and then into the fall of 1617, uh, so that perhaps this will become an annual event where we have an opportunity to, to parade our wares, so to speak, um, in front of you as a board. I think we believe strongly that uh, not only are you um, uh, you know, tasked with the governance of the, the district, but also our great voices in our community to spread the word about the things that are going on here. And I think that new courses, new programs, new things uh, at the high school are all a part of that uh, of that voice. So, so that's why uh, I asked Dr. Richardson if we could share those details with you. And like I said, I'm not going to take a lot of time. I'm going to highlight three specific departments. Uh, the Family and Consumer Science, the Business Department, and our Industrial Technology Program. Uh, the first one uh, in our Family and Consumer Science Department, we're going to be offering a new design course. Uh, and for those of you that are familiar with our, our Family and Consumer Science curriculum, this strikes a little bit of fear in my heart, as well as joy. Um, the last time we added a, uh, a course to our Family and Consumer Science Department, it was baking and pastries. And we have since averaged approximately 165 to 170 students moving through that, uh, that course every year. Uh, obviously, the allure of sugar and butter and cream um, uh, comes with with that piece. But uh, but we're really excited about this offering because it does take uh, what we've done in family and consumer science in a new direction. Um, we've begun to develop and expand our child psychology and, and child development program uh, with the addition of Karen Nelson to our, our family and consumer science staff uh, and Sherry Carlsrud, who's really uh, been the... the uh, 
grains and in some cases the 100 pound bags of flour, the brawn uh, of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, baking side and the, the culinary side, uh, we'll be venturing into uh, a course in design. And it really has the makings of, of being something pretty cool for students where uh, we're really, uh, and it was interesting because as we explored, uh, Sherry had said, just name it whatever you want to. This is saying this to me. I said, well, how would I know what to name it? And she said, well, I don't know what to name it because it's going to be all things to all kids. Uh, well, we couldn't put that in a title without confusing people, but the design course is really built around the notion of kind of catching the wave of this current popularity of design, be it interior design, uh, landscaping design, uh, fashion design, uh, and, and allowing students to kind of uh, create projects in their areas of passion within the confines of the course. So giving them some general tools, general education in the in design curriculum, and then letting them use those and apply those to projects that, uh, of their choosing. So what I would envision, similar to what we have when we display honors artwork in the spring, where there are as many types of art as there are students in the art class, uh, similarly, uh, opportunities within the design course are going to be really limitless to, to the imagination and the creativity of the students, and, and Sherry is intending that very purposefully. So we're excited about that offering in family and consumer science. Uh, another piece, and some of you have been uh, involved in our conversations with community partners, with uh, agencies in an attempt to develop career pathways to make some of our what I call random programming, a little more intentional for students who really want to see a, uh, a career at the end of whether it be high school or high school combined with uh, some higher ed opportunities. So um, in that spirit, Julie uh, Walner and, and Sarah Van Sickle in our business department have designed uh, what at this point is called a business honors program, which maybe sounds a little highfalutin, uh, and, uh, but, but the intention is again to develop a career pathway around the notion of business ed. So taking a look at some of the courses we already offer and beginning to develop some new courses that are relevant to the idea of how do we prepare students for a career in business or for a collegiate experience in, in a business school or a management school. Uh, and this, the, the, the kind of the marquee piece of this proposal is that students will apply to the program as sophomores and juniors and there will be a series of, of now these are electives, but required electives within the confines of this pathway. Uh, that will culminate in a senior honors capstone course that, that uh, Julie's intent is to, to uh, uh, partner with some local business community members to develop some meaningful experiential opportunities um, in our community as part of, that, of part of that coursework. So again, look for the business honors, uh, honors program in the business education department. And really the last piece in terms of industrial technology uh, is not so much a new course or a new program, but a new name. Uh, and uh, Mary Grace Hansen and I have dialogued about this piece, but the, uh, the industrial tech department, previously the vocational tech department, and I'm sure if I go further, further far enough back, I'll find shop. Industrial arts. Industrial That's arts. Uh, has proposed, and, and uh, we're going to move forward with uh, a new name for that department, technology and engineering. Um, and it really is a name that I think is overdue. Um, in the sense that we've been offering the Project Lead the Way engineering uh, pathway uh, for a number of years now. And, and uh, if you think about, you know, in my, in my experience as a youth and even as an adult growing up, when I thought about the industrial park in my hometown, it, it wasn't a place I said, wow, that would be really cool to work there. And that is no disrespect to, to people who worked in the industrial park, but it was just not, it was not an image that, that, that I was able to kind of create for myself uh, a logical pathway to a career in that regard. So given the opportunities and the modernization that we have done in our industrial tech program, I think that technology and engineering is, is really an apt, uh, an apt title change <coughs> to that department. And, uh, and I would see it as, a, uh, as a, uh, a moment to kind of shift not only the title of the department, but also to begin to, to mold the philosophy to some more modernized uh, ideas in terms of what we want to deliver in terms of course content so that the courses aren't getting stale uh, and so that we're really staying you know in touch with with uh, what the workforce needs in terms of students who are preparing in that regard and specific to technology and education and then the last piece I would just like to share with you another again sort of curricular sort of functionality of building um, Kim Brisky is here and Kim and I have have dialogued multiple times about uh, about technology and stewardship. How are we using technology in a way 
that gives students all the opportunities they need to have in our modern world, but also how are we being stewards of the finances that our community is is uh, providing us to provide students that technology. So uh, in that vein, uh, we are actually going to take the, uh, in the technology and engineering wing of our building, um, a smaller lab uh, and, a, and a similarly sized lab in the art area and combine those into a new state-of-the-art lab that will essentially be in between the two departments. And so the two, two departments will share uh, that lab. And uh, it was interesting because initially, Kim and I thought it would it was the, the the trick would be to get them to share. And that's, again, no disrespect to the two departments, but just there are there are opportunities that the freedom and the flexibility of having your own lab allows you to have. And, and when when you're sharing those those resources, sometimes there are some some uh, barriers and obstacles scheduling wise. Uh, but it was literally, and I mean moments uh, after we talked with the two department uh, groups uh, about this this new lab and the space it would be, but quite literally the, the size of the physical space will allow us some computer uh, space as well as some, uh, I would just kind of call it free creativity space. Uh, that it literally was moments later that both the members of both departments were talking about the possibilities instead of the limitations. So excited to see how that partnership can kind of blossom uh, and grow. There is a natural connection between visual art and, uh, and our technology and education program. We hope that that, that facility uh, merger will also allow some philosophical and coursework mergers as well. So. With that, I will conclude our uh, update. Wow, exciting stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, questions? No. Uh, I, I think there's a question in here. It'll take a minute to form it, probably. <laughs> uh, Usually you wait are, to the are end. Are colleges graduating teachers <coughs> in the area of, so you have a, a teaching certificate to teach technology and engineering? Does the certificate say that? It would say in, a, in excuse me, stumbling over my words, in career in technology education, so CTE. And now I will, I will explain that that. Skip the titles, but we're, we're it's, it's effectively being able to teach in that area. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. You've answered the question. All right, Thank right. You. <coughs> um, well, life has changed, and I remember coming down here and, and Part of the mix there is when I think of the industrial arts and industrial education, I mean, I remember like yesterday, I, I made a boat my senior year shop down here. I um, made a lot of furniture. So boat? Yeah, it worked, yeah. It worked great. No, it worked, it worked great. Actually, I was going to turn it into a kit and market it, but uh, insurance issues. Um, the, uh, the question, I guess, that I have when you take, you know, going from industrial arts and, and thinking, you know, What's cool? Uh, Technology is cool. Engineering is cool. I mean, that's you know we're, we're we're trying to compete on a on a world basis with with our kids. But when I when I look at that, and still within this technology and engineering and thinking coming out of the the tradition of what I'm thinking of about years ago, um, yeah, it's it's neat to build furniture. Um, it's it's neat to to work on cars. So how does that? I mean, is there still going to be shop and working with cars? And I think our whole paradigm for transportation is changing. I mean. So, I mean, how do you, within this new definition um, and in changing that paradigm, you know, is the, uh, the shop for the wood shop going away and how is that dealing with, with, with cars and, and figuring, figuring out the average Joe can work on a car? Uh, is that going away or is, is that still going to be around? Yeah, great question, Jeff. It's not going away by any stretch. And, and one of the things that what well, this board in its in its different evolutions over the course of the 10 years I've been here have really remained consistent in their commitment to a comprehensive education. And we have seen, I, I believe that we have lived and breathed that as a high school staff in terms of saying we want to allow students to be able to pursue career interests, but also uh, personal interests. So baking and pastries for 90% of those students who are, are moving through those courses, they're not headed toward culinary science. But they come out of that experience with some pretty decent skills on how to, in this case, bake. But those are transferable to, to cooking and just and really life skills. So similarly, those classes aren't going away in the, in the industrial tech or in the tech and engineering uh, program. What they are doing is modernizing. And so the equipment that, that uh, perhaps was there when you were there, some of that is still there to kind of teach. There, there are still some components of that that are very universal in terms of their, their uh, the knowledge base and the, me and the meaning of value to kids, but then also incorporating those technological changes that have occurred in the automobile industry, uh, in, in manufacturing, in woods, 
uh, where you know where the saw that you know this is maybe a silly example, but when you use the table saw and you put your finger in the way, that was your own problem. Now the saw stops instantly and keeps your finger attached to where it should be. So things like that that are very simple on a simple level, the technological advances, but also just looking at how how that furniture is built, how those cars are fixed, how those cars are created has changed and evolved over time. So we want to make sure that at least our equipment is keeping up. What you call the shop, schools across the country are now calling innovation labs. So you know, even, even the philosophical approach to those, those spaces is changing. Mm -hmm. Margaret, <coughs> this is really exciting. My daughter is in design at Iowa State, which is oh, a huge excellent. engineering school. Mm -hmm. And they now have programs that are a collaboration between the College of Design and the engineering and they've created a new major, and I'm sorry for lack of uh, my memory, I can't remember what the name of the major is, but it's designing product that cool. looks good and works. <coughs> and uh, in our world right now, the um, you know, just here in Minnesota, we're, we're missing welders. They're at a complete dearth of welders. Right. And in my world, I've seen, and I used to work at the Healthcare Academy that you guys have heard about, biomedical engineering mm -hmm. is going to just explode in the next generation. So these kids will be in there tinkering and, li and learning and be able to put it into real world experience and with biomedical engineering, probably a two year degree and then right. wherever you can take it from there. So exactly. it's amazing. Yeah, and there are some schools in our region, Rochester for example, that are offering biomedical engineering as a course really? at their high school, right? So, That's so those, certainly those opportunities abound. That's great. Wow. One of the, I also want to be a pitch man for the trade, so we're going to, we need, we need trade people around. <laughs> we are hearing you loud and clear. So mm -hmm. let's Absolutely. keep that rolling. You bet. Other questions or comments? Um, thanks, Joel. This You're is welcome. great, and we will <coughs> absolutely be delighted to hear about this every year. And I think um, I also want to thank you. You're part of the Northfield Promise Initiative mm -hmm. that is addressing the career and college readiness right. benchmark. And I'm a part of that action team as well. And we have an extremely enthusiastic group of community business leaders that are going to work towards helping us define. And I think what you have seen, and certainly um, Chris, you have seen, is a paradigm shift back to career mm -hmm. readiness and being able to. Um, what I loved about your design was <coughs> your design classes, what is their passion? Mm -hmm. And I think that we have spent some time at the action team talking about passion and, and, and getting kids to identify what that passion and what that interest is and being able to steer kids more towards not necessarily a four-year college track, which is kind of where you know, the, the focus has been and it's now coming back to, to more uh, you know, career and certificate programs and, and trade skills that are absolutely essential if we're going to keep a very strong economy in Minnesota. Right. So there's a lot of pieces that you know work around that and, and the identification I think at the legislative level as well is helping drive a lot of this. But um, certainly appreciate the initiative you guys are taking to really identify those areas within within the high school that we can um, you know improve and, and develop new curriculum, um, especially around like a lot of those 21st century mm -hmm. Um, skills and I know um, Greg Jelena is doing that same sort of work at the right. middle school too and identifying those opportunities. So um, this is a great presentation and again we will absolutely look forward to next year and we great. appreciate the work because we know I know that being a part of the action team for um, the career and college readiness requires a lot of extra time on your part. And so oh, it's a great initiative. You being it's a, a great part initiative. of that as well. All right, thank you. Okay. All. Appreciate it. Thank you. Oh no, has yeah. one. I'm going comments. to take my. The degree in industrial technology and deliver it tomorrow to the historical society. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Hey, and when was that degree <coughs> conferred? How far back can you count? <laughs> and I'll add my bowl, but I didn't I better use both hands. Both. <laughs> All right, so we'll move on to our first item for individual action. Again, there was um, remind board members. It's the uh, we're discussing the fiscal year 2015. 16 community service budget revisions. Aaron Bailey's here to present that, and there was a um, copy of the PowerPoint in our table file. So take it away, Aaron. Great. Thank you for letting me be here tonight to share the fiscal uh, year 16 community service <coughs> budget revision. As a reminder, Val will be here in May to present the fiscal um, year 17 community services budget. On the plus side, that budget is 99% done right now, which probably has never happened in February before. So we're 
moving forward at a good pace. Just a quick reminder of the principles of community education, those being lifelong learning, maximizing community and school resources, and community and school facilities, promoting collaboration and partnerships, and citizen involvement. Um, I'll start tonight with just what um, the numbers of what the revised budget now looks like, and then after this slide, we'll walk through the factors that have contributed to these changes over the last year. Um, you saw a very similar screen when I did present the budget back in May. So a few updates, we do now have the fund balance as of June 30th, 2015, which is $435,081. Um, the <coughs> preliminary budget, which is what I presented um, back in May, was $2,182,689 in revenues and expenditures of $2,191,373. So this left us with a negative fund balance of just over um, $8,600 was what was the preliminary budget um, for, two, for fiscal year 2016. The ri revised budget, which you can see below, has revenues of $2,264,646. Expenditures of $2,239,501, which puts us at um, a, now a fund balance that we're looking at of just over $25,000 for this current fiscal year, which would then increase our total fund balance to $460,226. So some of the major factors contributing to the um, changes in revenues and expenditures. One, and I believe I've said this to you the last couple of years, is an increase in participation in our school age child care program, which would be the Kid Ventures program. Um, we have seen since the end of last school year an increase of 53 students. And actually over the last three years, there's been an increase of 120 students in the program, which is really great growth to see. Um, some of the factors that have contributed to this increase in growth, um, one, we certainly are seeing a little bit of increase in enrollment throughout the district, which obviously has an, a play here and families making a choice to potentially participate in Kid Ventures. But one of the larger um, contributing factors is the all-day kindergarten. So when we used to have half-day kindergarten and provided Kid Venture child care, either in the morning before school or after school, we weren't, if you went to half-day kindergarten, you pr likely chose another site for child care options simply because we didn't serve you either from that eight to noon or from the noon to three. And so with all-day kindergarten, we've picked up um, a large number of families through having them in the school building all day and thus being able to provide child care on either side. The d increase in school age child care does um, affect both the revenues and expenditures. Obviously, we have increase in fees that are coming in, but we obviously need more staff, supplies, food, all of the above. Um, another factor would be the market rate adjustment to salaries for some of the community school coordinators some of the early venture <coughs> staff, and then the kid venture site leaders. And these, of course, all came to you as a school board earlier this year. Um, not only is this an effort to recruit and retain the highest quality staff, but also we had found that there were just some areas where we had staff that potentially were supervising folks that were being paid more than they were at this time. So it was an effort to both keep, the keep and recruit staff that we're looking for, and then also to right some spots where we had gotten a little off balance. Um, and so that is primarily affecting the expenditures. Also expect, um, for this year, affected the expenditures is the addition of the Early Ventures preschool room. This is room 102 at Longfellow, and most of you know that. That was the former conference room, which you've probably all been in. The, um, the room will be licensed by this summer and open and taking um, students in the three to five age in the fall, starting in September. The expenses associated with getting this room ready, though, will be incurred in this fiscal year. So in order to be licensed, we have to have the room fully set up before we are able to be licensed. So all furniture, staffing, any other purchases that need to be figured out will all be incurred in this fiscal year. Um, then, of course, just award, the awarded grants and impact that they have on revenues and expenditures. And just to highlight a couple of the larger ones that played out in our budget, the Pathway to, uh, to Early Learning Scholarships, we were originally awarded $35,000. It was then increased bef um, after we did budgets, but right at the start of the year, to $52,500. And so they had awarded those that we didn't need to, we just needed to do a revised budget, not reapply for the grants. And so that had an effect on our budget. 
prime time programming too, obviously when I presented here last May, we did not know the final budget allocation. We did receive $21,500, um, so that was corrected. And then other um, bridges to kindergarten, some other ECFE grants, some for mentoring were all corrected in the budget as well. And finally, we had an increase in state aid for school readiness, and this again was decided after the budget presentation last May. And so our school readiness state aid increased from um, just over $49,000 to just over $95,000, and we will also see a pretty significant increase in that in our next fiscal year as well. So then again, just to give you a little bit of history here is the past um, several years of fund balance history for the Community Services Division, and now with the updated of where we actually ended fiscal year 15 and where we'll be projected to end uh, fiscal year 16. And um, the fund balance projected for fiscal year 16 of that $460,226 is 21% of the Community Services overall budget. So with that, I'll take any questions or comments. Uh, questions? No. What is your goal for a fund balance as a percent? Sure. So we have sat with, uh, our goal has been very similar to the district goal, kind of in that 16 to 20% range. Um, we've carried a little bit more lately, partly with the hopes of adding this space like the Early Ventures preschool room. We are hoping to add another section of hand-in-hand -hand preschool next year. And so being able to, um, as we've seen increase in interest and um, demand for some of our program areas, being able to be responsive to that. And we'll be obviously using some of those school readiness dollars to do those too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I just had a question. It sure seems like it's taking a long time to have that room approved. It, it seems like, you know, again, the process, how long, it's just to re just to refresh all of our memories, when that process started and how sure. long that will ultimately take to approve a classroom, right? That's right. That's how we're doing. Well, we are actually, mm -hmm. actually waiting on two things right now. Okay. So um, Early Ventures is licensed to the Department of Human Services. Um, we were due for an annual visit, which happens every, I shouldn't say annual, a biannual, every two years. They do come out and visit our site to reissue our license. That was originally supposed to happen by December 31st of 2015. Uh, we've, we've paid the fee. They have all of our paperwork that goes with that. We've received our new license. We have not actually received the visit from DHS yet. And so they have contacted us. And we have contacted them. They are aware they haven't been out. They say they're at about a six-month delay in visiting sites around the state because um, we are trying to tie the, re -lic the license of the new room in with that visit. Mm -hmm. So our original hope was that that was going to be done by December, but we don't have a licensor out to see us yet. And so the um, licensor visit is always a surprise because that is part of their, their coming to check that you're meeting the standards and have everything filed accordingly. So we, w we won't know the official date that they are coming. They have historically always visited us in November on the years that the, um, our license has been up to be um, renewed and, and viewed. Uh, so we're hoping, they're telling us they'll be, they'll be out to us by June. So that is part of our hope that then that room will be licensed by then. But the, um the license for the early venture is not at risk. No, no, we already, we have the printed certificate, we have the license, mm -hmm. we've completed all of what is required on our end, which is, there is a, some of paperwork that goes with your, your resubmission, there's a fee, things like that. We've submitted all of those pieces and received the license, we just haven't received the official visit. And we need that. can occupy the room. Yes, and we need that official visit to occupy okay. the new room. When will the result report? Will the report on the visit be six months behind too, going in? Typic which was Casey no, that well, time. typically we the report has been issued almost on the spot. Oh, so okay. if you're in violations, they typically, t you know, if there are any violations, they're going to tell you right then and there, typically of the violations, and then there's a little more detailed report that comes out afterward. But if there's been any major violations, then they typically have come back. We've never had any major violations. We've had two times w where we didn't have one document on a, like a transcript in someone's file. Okay. And we've known that on the day it's happened, so. Okay. Okay. Um, 
if there's no further questions, board members, this is an item for individual action. So I'm just pointing out that the new recommendations, <coughs> recommendation is on the cover sheet of your table file. Okay, that's what I was just saying. It has the corrected. It was a correction to what was put in The state aid was yeah, omitted in, the, in okay. what was in your original board packet. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so the motion <coughs> is to approve a revised fiscal year 16 community service budget of revenues of $2,264,646 and expenditures of $2,239,501. Is there a motion to approve? Move. Moved by Margaret. Second? Second. Second by Ellen. Any discussion or questions? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, that is our only item for individual <coughs> action, so we'll move on to approval of the consent grouping. Um, as a reminder, there were a number of personnel items in the table file to be added to the consent grouping. Um, is there anything that anyone would like to pull from the consent grouping? We would like yes. to well, pull yeah. up. Uh, number six here <laughs> under D. We would like okay. to pull one item from consent grouping. Sorry. But I don't think we will have that opportunity. So, with the exception of the one item we would like to all pull from the consent grouping, are there any other items that anyone would like to pull? Okay. Is there a motion to approve the consent grouping? So moved. Moved by Alan. Is there a second? Second by Fritz. Um, all those in favor of approving the consent grouping say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Motion carries. All right. So we have a number of items for, in for information this evening. Um, the first item is the um, first initial look at the 2017-18 school year calendar. Dr. Richardson. Okay. Uh, basically, in, in your materials, you'll find the uh, <coughs> copy of the draft of the 2017-18 school calendar as recommended by the Meet and Confer <coughs> Committee. Remember the Meet and Confer <coughs> Committee is made up of board members, administrators, and uh, members of the um, Northfield Education Association. Uh, what you'll see is some of the elements which are very, very similar to what you've seen in the past. Uh, basically, two days of new teacher activity uh, in, the, in the beginning before the actual uh, pre-service days. Four days of pre-service, including uh, one day that is, is totally set aside for teacher preparation. Three other days that are tied into staff development and will also include the Ready, Set, Go day. Um, the two days in October that are the admin conference, uh, a setup that allows a day before the Thanksgiving break <coughs> when we will be doing staff development on that day, a winter break that begins on the 21st of December and goes through the 1st of January. Uh, the changes that have been made that are different than what we've seen before begin with the January date. You'll notice that there is no school on Martin, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And basically that's a little bit different than what we've had in the past. In the past, we've had no school for students, but it was a work day for uh, teachers and we've now set that as a, a non-school day for everyone. So uh, that's a modification from what we've done before. And I, th I think basically responds to uh, both staff and student desire to be uh, away that day and have an opportunity to celebrate the Martin Luther King's birthday. Uh, then we also are looking at uh, doing something then in February on President's Day, uh, the 19th of February, which we're now looking at making that a staff development day if we don't have more than two days of s snow vacation prior to the 19th of February. So. The idea being if we have like what we had this year where we had two snow days um, earlier this year and you would have had another day before President's Day, knocking on wood, mm -hmm. uh, that then th that would give us the opportunity to make up that first day on the 19th. Then we're looking at spring break and the situation there is that St. Olaf is off on one week and Carlton is off on a different week. Uh, as we tried to look at numbers, we tried to look at having the least 
disparity in terms of total days in the two semesters. This seems to make that work with 88 days in semester one and <coughs> six days in semester two. Uh, so we set that piece. And then what you'll notice then is that the last day for students is June the 7th with a second makeup day if, if we would have four days of snow days being allowed on the 8th if we had the uh, first day on the 19th. If not, uh, then basically we would be able to make up one student uh, contact day on the 8th of June if all the snow days are after the 19th of February. And then finally, uh, an additional day on June 11th, which could be a possible makeup day for teachers only. Again, I think what's important to realize on this is every year is different because <coughs> it absolutely does depend on when the holidays fall and when Labor Day falls in the, in the week. Uh, we know it's going to be on Monday, but it's, it can be anywhere from the 1st to the 7th. So uh, <coughs> we need to basically uh, respond to that as we move forward. But we b believe this calendar is uh, a, a good compromise position, I think, from everybody's perspective and would like to recommend that for your consideration. Again, this being just first reading tonight and an opportunity then at the next board meeting for final approval. So, board members, are there questions or comments for Dr. Callender? Ellen. So, I'm, uh, Julie and I are on the meet and confer committee, and it's um, when you come up with the calendar, it really is a negotiation process where, you know, you, you may not leave with everything you thought was going to play out the way it does, but I think it, it balances mm -hmm. something. One of the things that came up in discussion, which I think is really premature, but we are looking at the 17 and 18 calendar, is by this point, will will there be some other ways of looking at making up snow days? Mm -hmm. And we don't know. This is looking at digital days, and, and that's mm -hmm. out too far for us to predict, but that was part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. We just can't say anything at this point. Other th and so this is why we still have makeup days. We are trying something new with this calendar, which is instead of having two at the end, trying to insert one earlier, which is a little risky, mm -hmm. because if you have a heavy March day, that's not going to help us. Mm -hmm. But this is similar to the 1314 calendar, yeah. I believe, mm -hmm. which is we used almost the exact same strategy that year, again, because of the timing. Um, I think it's also important to know that we are looking seriously at, at digital day strategies. We know that right now, you know, two districts that are working with that are Farmington and St. Peter. Um, Farmington has some unique capabilities there because they're an innovation zone school which means they have a lot more flexibility to do things. And I think um, the jury may still be out a little bit. But Matt, you might want to share just kind of what, what your thoughts are as, as we're going forward, because I know you're putting together a committee to take a look at that. Yeah, so coincident <coughs> excuse me, coincidentally, uh, Kim Bristol and I and Scott Peterson, who you might remember presented some of the high school uh, SIP plan, uh, we have come together to start forming a group to look at how digital learning days or flexible learning days is the local term that we're using could be a potential down the line and we're very early in that process. Uh, we are currently trying to recruit a broad based stakeholder group to screen the idea and it's not just uh, a very simple piece but when we're talking about a K-12 component it's really important. So we always start with the why and why we think it's important to take a look at it is the fact that you know, we are really looking at ways that we can limit disruptions to the learning process. And we know when we have two school days off, like we did a few weeks ago, it, every teacher will tell you it takes a little bit of time to get back into the rhythm. We've even had a little bit of disruption with state hockey tournament, which is a welcome disruption, and we would welcome it again later this week. But thinking about how can we leverage the resources that we have to help learning continue uh, during what we have in terms of Minnesota winters and so on and so forth. So uh, we are putting together this group of folks initially to screen the idea and really to look at the strengths and the, ch the challenges and the opportunities. How a, a digital or a, a flexible learning day works for a kindergarten student will be very different than a senior high student. Mm -hmm. We are looking at a number of different pieces. One of my favorite ones so far is the Zambroda Mazeppa mm -hmm. approach, which they call wild days, which are <laughs> weather-induced learning days. And they have some <laughs> very creative things. In fact, for kindergarten through second graders, they actually have the wild packet that goes out in October 
in which they have creative activities like wild bingo, which include all kinds of academic activities that don't require a computer. It's one of the spaces is reading 20 minutes for the day. Another is playing outside for a certain amount of time. There are other mathematical components. Count how many of these kinds of objects you have in your house. So you have a predetermined activity that is a strong learning activity and some fun, uh, but yet it continues the learning process for students. And then, of course, at the secondary level, for, we have a lot of tools available with Schoology and students with devices, and there are some hurdles that we have to look at there. But our goal is really to have the screening committee do the once over on it and say, what are the strengths, what are the challenges? And then if they get to a point to say, you know, we really should look at this further, then solicit feedback from a broader group of people, including PTOs and things like this. Uh, normally, we've been on, the, on what I would call the bleeding edge of these kinds of things. We're letting some other people do that this time, but we're closely <laughs> watching farm. We like to be on the cutting, but not the bleeding. That's edge. right. Yes, uh, <laughs> the leading edge is what we like to call it. But we're, we're closely looking at what other schools have done. We've got some very detailed plans from St. Peter, who yeah. it's very scripted what the responsibilities are that day. Um, I think it is a matter of time. Uh, we also don't want to ruin the uh, the beauty of that snow day that all Minnesotan <laughs> kids love. At least but once. when yeah. you've got school districts that are missing four or five and a few years ago, we missed yeah. four school days. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe every day of learning is really critical. Mm -hmm. And if we can make a change that allows us to continue that, we think it's worth exploring and, and potentially implementing. So it is an exciting discussion. Mm -hmm. Questions or comments for around this issue? Um, thank you very much for, for um, kind of telling us what's going on there. And again, you know, just some real forward thinking and, and we appreciate the, the um, work that you'll, you'll be doing. And, and I know this is probably a, a topic that, Kim, that will be near and dear to Kim's heart. And uh, you'll be anxious to, to work on, on the process of really vetting the potential of that for the district. So thank you for that work and for that work. Okay, so as uh, Dr. Richardson had mentioned then, everyone will have the opportunity over the next couple of weeks to review the calendar and um, we will um, approve that for um, our next board meeting. Um, again, we're uh, way ahead of where we have been in terms like of approving. A year, like a year, a year ahead. ahead. But yeah, we year know ahead. that um, our community is really always asking for that. There's a number of people that have to bid vacations and make those kind of family decisions. So we think this is a really good um, piece that we can do for our community. So um, we'll look to do that uh, final approval. Just a reminder that the calendar for next year was approved last fall. Mm -hmm. So that's already up on the website. Okay. This okay. is two years out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is 17, 18 already. Yeah, correct. Good. All right. Thank you. Um, so our next item for information is the enrollment report. Yes, and if you'll take a look at the enrollment report, the best thing I can say to you is same old, same old, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, we're sitting within two kids, plus or minus 4,000 over the course of this entire year. So actually our numbers are up a little bit from where we've been before. And we maintained a good solid number <coughs> even through February 39.98. So again, I think that puts us in a, in, a, in a good place as we move forward with funding for this coming year because at, at least at this point, we've not seen any trailing off of enrollment yet. So uh, it's all good, but, but pretty boring because it's pretty much the same as it's been every month for the last seven or eight months. Okay. Okay. Any questions on enrollment? Okay. We have no questions on that. I did want to add an item for um, information and, and quick discussion with board members around the um, process that we will um, need to consider here in the, in the very short term of uh, superintendent search. Um, so I know that each of us is keenly aware that the hiring of a superintendent is the single most important responsibility we have as a board. So um, with that being said, I'd like to recommend that we um, consider appointing a subcommittee of board members, um, could be a subcommittee of um, only up to three, that would um, <coughs> develop a process for a superintendent search. Um, as a way to, to begin um, dialoguing about the process that we see. Um, 
And and what I would would most welcome whether um, you know once if if people are interested in being part of this subcommittee, <coughs> if they could if they could let me know that. But I think all board members, I would really look for your input in terms of um, ideas you have for the process, um, criteria and. Um, characteristics we'd be looking at in the superintendent, some of the issues that, that you think that the superintendent would be most likely addressing um, in, in um, the near future and, and um, as we move forward as a district. So um, really give some thought. Um, I know this is all, we're all still processing where we're at with this, but I think um, with all intents and purposes it already being March, I think it would be prudent if we um, establish a subcommittee that could work on um, developing a process and coming back as soon as the, our first board meeting in March with um, some recommendations that, that the board could, could consider. Um, again, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be etched in stone, it would just be a process for consideration. We'd have the opportunity to dialogue about um, that process and, and how we may want to change that or um, adjust the recommendation. Um, so that we can move forward um, with this important search. Um, yes, Margaret. Would Chris be able to weigh in too on what to look for in a successor? I, I would be happy to talk to someone about things that I think you should think about, mm -hmm. but remember this one is really your process. Mm -hmm. And what I don't want to do is have anybody coming back and suggesting in any way mm -hmm. that I'm trying to mm -hmm. sway you in any direction. And I, I think what you'll find if you talk to other board members from around the state or country, they would probably say no, this is the one time where you need to Really? Kind of do it yourself, yeah. and 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 you know I yeah I trust yeah. you guys to have great instincts. I, th I think you did a pretty good job the last time. <laughs> um, <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> but, but, but I but, wasn't. But, 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 but you know again my sense is I think you know the kinds of things that you're looking for, um, and again I think as Julie suggested the concept of you want to create a process. I think you want to think about you want to bring anyone in to help make that process work? Are you looking for a search firm or a search consultant or someone else? When when I was hired, they used a search consultant. Other districts around the state typically will use, oftentimes we use some kind of search individual to help, especially to gather the, the numbers of folks that you want together. But those are decisions that I think as a board you want to make. And again, I think if you have a, a subcommittee who can work through that process, that gives you the best chance of kind of putting that together and then bringing that recommendation back to the whole board to listen to at the next meeting. Okay, so is there any questions? Um, again, if you're interested in serving on that subcommittee, let me know, but um, I think as, as board members, it's incumbent upon all of us to really spend some time thinking about what we feel um, is, is an important part of the process and as we move forward. Um, again, it's the single most important decision we will make as, as a board, so um, I know we will all take that to heart as we move forward. Um, we've been fortunate this isn't something that we have done um, often, so. Um, you have three superintendents in the last 28 yeah. years. So do you, by what time should board members get back to you if they're interested in being on the subcommittee because then that committee needs to meet and be ready to formulate a process, process by to share yeah, excellent in, point. In, yes. in March. Mm -hmm. at so first if meeting. people could come to that decision whether you'd like to serve on the subcommittee within the next day or so. Um, next day or so? If you could let me know by Wednesday maybe, if that's realistic for board members. Mm -hmm. um, again, even if, you know, as part of the subcommittee, it's really developing the process and then moving forward whether, um, you know, there's other opportunities for um, you know, to have to back away based on your schedule. We can always, um, you know, even appoint, as we've done with negotiations, we've had a, a person who's been appointed as a sub, um, which is always worth in the negotiation process. If there's traveling or personal schedules, mm -hmm. then that person could step in as a sub. So we may want to consider that also. Okay, any questions? All right, okay. So um, with that then, um, I will remind future meetings. One, I did want to um, remind board members about this coming Wednesday, the open house at the ALC from 3 to 5 p.m. Um, that Dr. Christian had mentioned earlier. 
uh, future board meetings Monday March 14th and I also wanted to make note um, we also have a board meeting on Monday March 28th now for the last few years we've um, not done the second Monday uh, meeting because it, it did occur right in the middle of spring break um, this year Monday March 28th actually occurs at the end of spring break our teachers will be here that day um, students are off but um, so I just for those of us who've served on the board for years, we're not used to having those two meetings, so I wanted to point that out. So again, Monday, March 14th, and Monday, March 28th, um, both at 7 p.m. in the high school media center. So with that, I ask the motion to adjourn. Moved by Noel. Second? Second, Second by Ellen. Okay. All those in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned.